I'll, in the next 15 minutes, I thought I'll just kind of give, um, you know, a sense of what I was privileged to, to do over a 14 year period, right? At the time when it started in 2004, just to give a bit of context, uh, for us in Asia, we were still kind of licking our wounds from the Asian financial crisis of 98 to 2000. So, you know, the corporate landscape and indeed the economic landscape needed quite a bit of fixing. Uh, the second comment I would say to contextualize the period is also, uh, as you know, in 04, uh, the notion of a shareholder economy was really front and center still. The, the, the notion of a, you know, share, the shareholder value movement as opposed to the notion of a stakeholder economy that is, as we have heard from both Dean and Amy and others, uh, is very much you know, part of that quite strong mainstream with and without the washers, as, as, as we have heard, like, whether it's green, rainbow, or I've even heard about a blue wash. Blue wash is basically the color of the United Nations uh, flag because of the SDGs, right? and I suppose rainbow washing is, is around that. So we, we were somewhat against the grain when back in 04, and I should credit my alma mater, I think I did some work at Cambridge at the master's level. Uh, my background is actually investment banking. I was head of research of Solomon during the Asian crisis and very much focused on financial and markets at that time, right? But after the Asian crisis, I said, that, that's it, I'm exhausted. I took some time off <clears throat> to go to Cambridge uh, and I'm back at the Center of Development and Studies to, un to try and understand a bigger conception of value, basically, not just obviously financial, but also economic or some say strategic and all the way to societal. And I'm fascinated by the comment uh, by both Dean and, um, and Amy, the whole spectrum of, you know, from responsible to sustainable to ESG. I don't know whether I got that in the right order to impact investing, right? So obviously this whole spectrum, uh, you know, from do no harm to do some good to have real break breakthrough impact, right? Uh, you know, we, we all know there's definitional issues, but roughly we know that, you know, this is needed. So that, that context, I thought I'll, I'll uh, you know, contextualize first. Uh, the slides are on the busy side, so please just kind of fade out as if you're watching a movie and I'll try to narrate because the slides were designed as a bit like, you know, in lieu of an essay, a kind of paper is meant to be read, uh, but, you know, it will be there, but I thought I'll just highlight some of the key points, which is uh, we are often called a strategic investment fund. We're often categorized under the sovereign wealth fund category, but I'll explain later why it's not quite. Uh, by the time I finished about two years ago, we were managing, we had grown it about, you know, a bit more than about, about three and a half times with uh, incidentally no, no money coming in because the nature of Kazana is that it uh, basically, unlike other sovereign wealth funds, it did not get access to the, the oil money, for example, or the pension money, or indeed the foreign exchange reserves. We basically had a bunch of, frankly, quite difficult, crappy assets that were that were bombed out after the Asian crisis and we had to restructure and grow, put them into market uh, and be very careful on the liability side because we had no money coming in. But essentially it grew to uh, about 37 billion US dollars depending on the exchange rate. Typically we held control major positions in about 100 major companies. When I started in 04, I think only about 2% of that value was overseas, but part of our strategy was to go regional, I think in particular trying to capitalize on Malaysia's, I suppose, geographic endowment by being close to China, India, Southeast Asia, like centers of growth. And in the West, in the developed markets, actually, we, we had offices in London, in Silicon, uh, rather in San Francisco, who essentially invest in European and North American technology, actually. Uh, and again, you will hear that it wasn't just a financial imperative, but we were also looking at economic and strategic kind of linkages, right? So portfolio grows three and a half times. So that translates over 14 years to just under 10, well, 9.6% KGA. Uh, this is both realized and unrealized value. It's audited, etc. But significantly, ex ante, even at the start, we would target not just financial, but economic, which we kind of define as job creation, for example, technology acquisition, knowledge development, industrial policy is in there somewhere, regional expansion, but also societal returns. I mean, the usual stuff around CSR, but also other social interventions, uh, especially on poverty and human capital development. So there's shades 
of you know impact etc right um, and then we kind of uh, you know dub this whole thing as building through value which is essentially three conceptions of value financial economic societal along the way as we had heard earlier and you know we were doing this like 10 12 14 years ago indeed there was not many metrics around so we had to devise our own at the start uh, on a project called project chronos uh, uh, i was told by omar and Chris some interest in it, so i'm going to share a little bit more slides on that and in particular in this one we work uh, hand in hand with price waterhouse coopers their, their global sustainability team for about six years over the years i think we've we've kind of you know shared this on various platforms we've been a member of pri International Sovereign Wealth Fund, World Economic Forum, FCLT, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. After I left about two years ago, which I'll explain, uh, you know, so we were, I would say, a fairly early, I don't know about early, but certainly we were an advocate of thinking through stakeholder capitalism, so-called uh, responsible investment and II uh, impact investment philosophy. But there were other key drivers which I'll go through. That I, I'm naming five of them uh, because I think one of these things. Uh, is I believe, you know, you can't just push one lever. You need you need to push several levers at the same time to try and get a holistic set of uh, of outcomes. As you can see, and you can begin to imagine, it can get fairly complicated and complex actually. And this is uh, one of I think the the blind sides of this project is that it is actually difficult to sustain, which which I I, I accept. You know, uh, you know, given the the nature and some and often political nature of this kind of sovereign funds. Okay, so that's a brief intro. Um, oops, okay, this is clicking one by one. So yeah, this slightly repeating, but you know, this is what financial returns mean to us, uh, what uh, strategic or economic returns means, and what societal returns mean. Like we, we can go back, but roughly, you know, essentially, as you know, you know, uh, I mean, if I use a specific example. A wafer fabrication plant in Malaysia, and given where Malaysia was on its economic uh, development trajectory, it was very difficult to justify on pure financial terms. But when you start calculating input output tables uh, on what it contributes, you know, in terms of multiplier effect, in terms of knowledge effects, in terms of employment effects, uh, then the, the numbers actually start changing quite quickly. But who's going to bear that, right? So I think in some ways, a sovereign fund can do this easier uh, in some ways than, than a, a, a non-sovereign fund, right? Which obviously you have fiduciary and other duties. But arguably we had, we had, we had all of them too. And really, how do we find the balance and the trade-offs? I think the devil is indeed in the details. And societal and indeed the belief, uh, we are not off the camp that you know, we have to do everything. Obviously we pay taxes by the way, uh, you know, but we also created foundations where we saw on the public service delivery side, for example, there was either a lack of willingness or a lack of capability or a lack of capacity on the government side. Uh, so if I take an example on, uh, you know, the, the, every year in Malaysia, about 150,000 graduates from Malaysian universities couldn't get jobs. Uh, frankly, I think the, the whole system of government universities were producing jobs that were not quite market ready. So, so in other words, the base system wasn't quite producing that. That's obviously a public sector job. But we stepped in uh, and we tried to be proportionate about it. Uh, we can't solve the whole 100,000, but every year we would do about 15, 20,000. That's quite a lot of money to basically reskill and then use our networks with the market and the employment market to try and place these people out. Uh, I mean, that's one example of where there's basically a state failure and we tried to apply some of our capabilities on the market side. Uh, to, to do that. But obviously here, it's about balance, right? Because this, you can't overdo this. On the other hand, you know, trying to figure out what, what is the right mix. Okay, uh, I won't go through in this detail. These are some breakdowns of the kind of financial returns for what level of risk. Uh, for example, our asset cover, and later you will hear, uh, you know, we had to be quite careful how we manage uh, the liability side. And indeed, af after about four or five years of, we started in 04, the global crisis came in. And when we did some back testing, I think you know, the companies that we were carrying from the Asian financial crisis, had it not been for some of these reforms and you know, fairly moderate gearing and other, you know, so non-use of derivatives, for example, uh, we felt that you know, by and large, many, a few com major companies who had gone 
into the red if not for those kind of thinking, right? So obviously you have to look at risk as well. The economic stuff again, uh, you know, special economic zones, for example, um, to our colleagues from Singapore, Iskandar was an economic zone on the southern tip of Peninsular Malaysia facing Singapore that we, we, we basically were tasked with developing. And this very industrial policy, developmental work, if you apply the normal financial metrics, you, many of these projects would not have taken off, right? So we have, I think up to the point I left, I think we had hit something like about 70 billion US dollars of investments came in, of which we put in only about 10%. Uh, in other words, we use our network and convening power to bring other investors, you know, on the mid. So, so for example, Pinewood Studios from the UK, it's not the most natural place to set up a movie studio. But, you know, so those kind of structuring skills we try to bring in that looks at not just finance, but certainly economic metrics and, and the impact on the communities around there. Uh, knowledge development, again, you know, we set up think tanks, we did all kinds of stuff uh, and corporate investors. So, okay, that's the first driver. So, so the thinking that we were not just a sovereign fund, wealth fund, but it wasn't just about wealth, it's about development. And this is how we define. Along the way, the, the moniker Sovereign Development Fund was given, not by us actually, it was by OECD, which I was a bit surprised. Uh, I think their, their, their growth center actually came up with this moniker. And uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of literature on SWFs, as you know. So I think that's where we were just because of our context and our, our kind of, uh, you know, uh, provenance, if you like. The second driver was, you know, uh, as I reflect a bit now, we use a blend of public and pub private sector instruments. So about 70, 80% of our companies of that 37 billion were listed. Uh, but sometimes, you know, so we had, you know, a lot, quite a lot of companies where well, many did very well, as you know, as, as you heard, because, you know, portfolio travel, but one company that didn't do well, and it was quite tragic, actually, Malaysia Airlines was one of our companies, as you know, it had the, 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 the very tragic twin disasters, right? So we, we had to take that off the market to quite major restructuring, but just to indicate that when I had to lay off uh, something like 6,000 people, which is about 30% of their worker base, which for Malaysia, which does not have an, an unemployment benefit safety net, 30% layoffs is a lot, okay? Uh, so no one has done this. Actually, we created a whole reskilling center and basically put 1%, which is about 60 million ringgit, about 15 million US dollars into reskilling these people. And in the end, about 80% of them uh, we were able to redeploy and reskill. I think it's, it's that level of, you can see that we use both public private sector mindsets and indeed my staff, I came from investment banking. We were mostly, you know, people from banking, from strategy consultants and, and, and the thought and, uh, you know, a kind of a hybrid uh, approach. Eh? I think, again, there, there's a lot of stuff on that. Now, sorry, the, the key driver number three, actually I need to highlight is at the end of the day, we can do all this macro theory. I think what really moves value is really at whether so the proverbial, you know, tire hits the road. And in this case, in about 20 companies, I think it's the old Pareto principle, the 20 companies for us was maybe about 80, 90% of the value. And indeed, it was actually about a third of the market cap of the Malaysian market. So we decided uh, fairly early on, and, and I was new to this, I think I had to learn this, to take a very intense, what is called a program management approach. Eh? So what this means is many thousand hours, you know, 29 meetings over over 10 year period, you know, it was somewhat pedantic, I couldn't see it, you know, we, but, but the context was these were companies that were quite bombed out from the Asian crisis, right? So we had to put in governance codes, procurement codes, Etc. And many of these companies were listed companies. So we, we needed to make sure that we didn't upset. This. So the kind of interventions had to be good interventions. So this, I would say, was key driver number three. Like, again, this you know, usually is a subject of one whole lecture separately. Uh, but so, so the key point is that there are project management and then there are program management. I think we went through this whole thing through a program management process. The fourth was to highlight as mentioned, because we don't have money coming in, as I mentioned, the oil money goes to Petronas, the foreign exchange reserve goes to the central bank, the pension money goes to our employee uh, pension fund, and, and they manage it very well, I must say, you know, by and large. Uh, we're not complaining, but it also almost forced us to be, 
to approach what I call real and sensible finance. So, for example, many of us came from you know investment banking backgrounds. Uh, we decided early on that you know, in terms of the risk appetite, given what we were, we had uh, to make sure that our risk uh, uh, tolerance here was relatively low. But it also meant you know things like we would we wouldn't get into derivatives. We had to obviously asset liability risk management. And in the case of Malaysia and Omar is familiar in the UK, I think there's also an Islamic finance uh, uh, council. Uh, again, uh, this is quite uh, detailed, but basically we, 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 we use certain principles there. We were often uh, leading in the work on uh, social bonds or social sukuks in how we finance ourselves and the CSR and the uh, you know, activity. For example, this uh, sukuk of the, the SRI sukuk, social responsible sukuk, sukuk, the Islamic term for bonds, was done to finance uh, what we call our trust schools, which are essentially public-private partnerships for, for government schools, right? So we took over the running, but, but we, 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 we got the, the other foundations and other pub members of the public to come and participate to fund this uh, and so on, right? So, so that, I would say, is the fourth driver. And finally, in the context of... Uh, Today, I understand um, you know, the, the measurement piece and, and we heard about impact measurement and management. And so we call this project Kronos. Uh, as I said, this started you know, around about 2010, so about 10 years ago. And in this case, uh, you know, at that time, there were not many frameworks. There were, of course, you know, triple bottom line reporting, so all kinds of things. So we almost had to, you know, as best try to do, you know, ourselves. Uh, of course, we with the help of PwC and 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 other organisations that we were members of, right? Uh, so essentially, the shareholder value, stakeholder value, and even within, obviously, the financial value. Uh, and one one, I think maybe one distinguishing factor that we we should highlight is the fact that Kazana, uh, the organisation I led was often, in most cases, was the, the major shareholder into these companies. So what that meant was we were in a privileged situation in terms of information, right? Obviously, we had to be careful about, you know, insider trading laws and so on and so forth. In fact, in fact, these are in our street, we, we separated this from our trading portfolio, et cetera, right? In fact, we hardly did any trading for that matter. I think it was mostly in, uh, and it basically observes all the, the blackout periods, et cetera. But what it meant was we had certain sets of data. We took legal views that, for example, I was not a shadow director in spite of being the, the CEO uh, of, of, uh, of Kazana, the major shareholder. And we would dive in in great levels of detail because we had a lot of data, sometimes too much, frankly, and, and basically starts to differentiating. And as you can imagine, and you know, many on this call are, are, are experts in measurement, I think. So we called it sustainable adjusted value. And, economic and societal impact value, right? Uh, we view stakeholders, these are the stakeholder categories that we try to identify. So for example, employees, right? I mean, how do you quantify this? I mean, one of the reforms that we did under what we call the orange book, earlier you saw those 10, ten colored books in our transformation program. Everybody had to go through what they, a kind of audit and employee engagement survey, for example. Uh, so, you know, uh, we don't want em employees, I mean, and the, the way the theory and the practice goes is that if your employee engagement survey result shows engagement of 95%, that's probably too happy. It sounds like a country club, that's not a company. Uh, but roughly, we think about 75 obviously, if it's 50%, that's morale is too low and that's a problem. Uh, roughly, about 70 to 80%, we think is a good zone, so we have a certain way to try and evaluate this. Similarly, the environment. Uh, development of vendor, supplier base, etc. Uh, I mean, these are some slides to try and explain the thinking between financial, economic, and societal value, measuring economic value and managing societal value. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'll be the first to say that, you know, we were experimenting. Uh, in fact, the journey, I think it's roughly the journey. And, you know, after I left, and this is one of the, 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 uh, the constraints or limitation of my, our sovereign development fund model because the, the sovereign part means we are exposed to political changes, right? So after I left, uh, I believe this pro project is a little bit mothballed. It may not have proceeded. 
although the discipline of tracking and moving, you know, the next stage was actually to come out quite publicly in Malaysia to say, let's take our power utility, which is one of the largest companies on the stock exchange in Malaysia called Tenaga, and market cap is, I don't know, say 30 billion US dollars. If we come out and say in our valuation, the true value is actually only 20 billion, I think that would create quite, quite major shockwaves. And, and why this is the difference, and mo most importantly, is the action that we can take that we think we can half that, that uh, gap within the next five years. That was actually the next step, which I think they have not quite got around to that. Uh, they can still do so, but, but that brings me really to some concluding thoughts. Um, I hope I'm still on time, Graham. That I think three key points. I think the first point is really, uh, yes, I think at least for that period, whether it will stick, I think only, well, time will tell that we were, we believe we were able to deliver some notion of true value, maybe not, you know, everything there, but certainly the portfolio grew by, you know, slightly shy of 10% per annum for 14 years. We did do, you know, there's all kinds of data on the economic strategy return and the societal return. I mentioned in my view, as I reflect back now a little bit is, uh, you know, one, it starts with a mindset that really said, in 2004, at a time when this was swimming against the tide somewhat. So I remember actually sitting down with Stern Stewart, um, uh, you know, the people who did EVA, right? Uh, because some sovereign funds actually measure, in fact, we do measure economic profit, not quite EVA, i.e. hence the notion of cost of capital, etc. right? But we felt that we needed a broader metrics back even in 04. So it starts with the mindset of, you know, picking and choosing your true north. In our case, for various reasons, we said the building through value and becoming a sovereign development fund was the first kind of, you know, quite foundational, uh, you know, uh, philosophy, if you like. The second is, you know, to take a pragmatic approach and not to get dogmatic, I think the word dogma was raised earlier, or, or you know, tied down or trapped into, you know, whether state or markets to all that kind of debate. Whatever works, we take it. You know, the famous Deng Xiaoping saying, doesn't matter if the cat is black or white as long as it catches rat. And, you know, although many of us had to learn new skills, we were not, you know, usually we were not so amphibious to be able to move between these two worlds. But over time we did. The third one was to do program management. The fourth one is watch your liability side carefully. The, the final lever is in a way, you know, this notion of true value and key performance indicators and measurement. Uh, and indeed, the management of that me measurement. Uh, in this case, we, we have access because of control levers. So nonetheless, I should highlight uh, the projects and program were covered the majority of state land companies. It was not all encompassing. I think there were parts that were not part of our program. Most notably, you, would, you, would, you, may, you may recognize is the infamous 1MDB scandal. I mean, this is... Uh, to my frustration and to many of us, but you know, it was outside our program. In fact, you know, I would get rating agencies coming to see us and say, oh, very good, et cetera, because we had some you know, bonds or sukuks issued, right? And they would cheekily ask, how is your evil twin doing? You know, because we do share the common parent, right? The sovereign fund. Uh, so, you know, so that's one uh, limitation, actually. Second, the longevity of this program uh, is also susceptible, obviously, this is its uh, Achilles heel, if you like, to changes in political landscape and resulting changes to commitment to reforms. Uh, nonetheless, I think it still had a, a kind of a net positive impact, in my view, um, in that, you know, we, we were able to deliver and many of these things were institutionalized and they're still going on. So, for example, uh, you know, I, we created an umbrella uh, foundation body. I carved out a billion US dollars on, on a particularly good and profitable year. And this umbrella body now, uh, looking at basically our philanthropic work, is supporting about 40, 50 uh, social and NGO organizations, right? And they can't, very difficult to reverse this because of trust laws and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, whatever changes in, 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 in the types of, uh, you know, the political vicissitudes, if you like, right? So. Uh, a final couple of minutes, I suppose, on, uh, I was also asked to comment briefly on the post-pandemic world. I don't have that much to add, and I, you know, because I think both Dean and Amy have highlighted what the sentiment and trends are, and I, I generally agree. I just wanted to add maybe one kind of um, 
perspective, uh, I think closely linked to the staff of work I'm trying to think about uh, in some of my quasi-academic role at Cambridge, which is around what is the impact about the financial system ultimately on society. And I think the big, the big one currently, as we know, is actually obviously you know, the impact of the unnatural monetary policy, which has now, we, we're talking about new normal, but this, this, this abnormal situation has become you know, quite long, right? since the 08 crisis and it's been more than 10 years and therefore I thought a good, uh, a good way of describing it I think came out in the FT the last couple of weeks they call about a K-shaped a K recovery so a K-shaped recovery means you know a divergent recovery between I suppose haves and have-nots but I would maybe try to modify that a bit by calling it a KK recovery the first K being the difference between the real economy and the and the market right obviously there's there's a kind of a you know big divergence right and then within the market itself as you know uh, you know it's a very narrow kind of uh, bounce of the i mean the, the 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 five six big tech stocks plus pharma and a few other sectors right and certainly that division between capital uh, and labor and society i think this is the worry and my own belief is that yes those trends are going but because if we believe those unnatural monetary conditions actually are resulting in you know, rents or windfall gains for, for the few, very few, uh, taxation is certainly one lever. But whether through regulation, through love or through fear, changes will have to happen. I think it will. The issue is, well, can it be orderly? I think it must be orderly. It has to be orderly. And indeed, the work on impact and other you know, variations and cousins of impact uh, needs to therefore have an impact. Thank you.